Merci, Eric. Uh, bonjour, monsieur, dame. It's an uh, honor to be here at the inaugural Internext event uh, here at the uh, Gaete Lyrique. Uh, we're across the street from the, uh, the Institute of Science and Technology. I'd say Metier is around the corner. It's a wonderful area to talk about innovation, uh, invention, changes in technology. I'm going to go through a few mechanical points first. Uh, this slide says predictions 2014. Most of what I'm going to talk about today is in fact a, a prévu of our 2015 technology, media and telecommunications predictions which will be launched uh, here in Paris, Claudia, on February 3rd, 3rd, Tuesday, February 3rd at our Deloitte office in Nai. Uh, you're all invited. Uh, oh, by the way, it's not just uh, it's not just naive. We do a road show. We'll be going to uh, uh, this year uh, many of the uh, cities that were labeled as French technology centers. We're doing uh, Grenoble. We're doing Lille. We're doing uh, Marseille, Aix-en-Provence, uh, Rennes, uh, or Nantes this year. I'm not sure which one. So we're covering all of France. So I hope to see you there. I will make available a PDF of these slides for everybody in the room. Uh, and hopefully we will have some time for Q&A. So let's go through. Uh, Deloitte's predictions have been published for this will be our 14th year. Let's kind of start off with, that's Père Lachaise, you know that, right? Is the PC dead? Personal computer sales did not do well in 2013. They were down 11% year over year, 15% in dollar terms. It was a terrible year for the PC. And when I meet startup companies that might be listing on Internext, they ask the question, should we be developing for the PC anymore? If the PC is a dinosaur, maybe it should all be tablet, all be smartphone. There is no question that smartphones and tablets are growing, but when you look not at sales of new devices, but at usage of existing devices, here is a slide uh, from December 2008 to November 2014. I'm, I'm sorry the data isn't more current. I thought that was funny. Most people show you slides that's five years old. This is, this is from November. It's very good. It's this week. PC share is down worldwide. There's no question, PC share is down. But at the uh, second week of November 2014, it is still 62% of all views worldwide. That's global uh, compared to uh, smartphone and tablet. And when we look just at Europe alone, you can see that as of October 2014, 67% of page views worldwide continue to come from personal computers. Two out of every three pages viewed remain on the PC. Is the PC shrinking? Yes. Is it dead? No. It still remains the dominant platform. Now, at this point, at this point, I'm going to pick on somebody here, have a child, seven-year-old, somebody have a seven-year-old in the room? Seven-year-old. Boy, girl. Boy, nice boy. Uses uh, the PC or tablet? Tablet. The PC is not dead now, but it will be soon because kids don't use computers, they use tablets. That is true. That is true of seven-year-olds. But Deloitte did a study of over 5,000 Americans, and we asked the question that if you had a choice between your laptop or your tablet, which one would you prefer? As you can see on the far right, those over 65 prefer the PC, still 60% to 40. But those trailing millennials, those 18 to 23-year-olds, 92% prefer the laptop to the tablet. Everything how you have read about how young people do not like personal computers is not merely wrong, it is backwards. No demographic is more attached to their personal computers than 18 to 23 year olds. Now, how is this possible? What does a seven year old do on a computing device? A seven year old, like your, your son. Well, they read a few stories. They play a few games, they watch a few videos. What does a 70, 70 year old mature do? 70s, do on a computing device. They 
play a few games, they read a few stories, they watch a few videos. What does a 17-year-old, Deset, what does a 17-year-old do? They play games that don't work on tablets. They don't read stories. They write essays to get into university, 5,000 words long. And around the world, they steal movies and TV shows and torrent them down and watch them on their laptops. The use case is such that the demographic cliff that is currently facing the newspaper industry is not occurring to the personal computer. So we believe that the, uh, uh, here's a slide. This is from Cisco. This is Cisco's visual networking index. And as you can see, even Cisco, by 2018, and this is not page views, this is by data, Cisco predicts that in 2018, four years from now, the personal computer will still be more than half the web traffic in the world. So very important point. I can't stress that enough. This is a picture of a 4K TV. 4K TV, also known as Ultra HD or 2160p. A wonderful picture, wonderful picture. You can go up to this television set and you can count the needles on that pine tree. Amazing picture. Uh, does anybody, anybody in the room own a 4K TV? One guy. You won the lottery recently or something? This set, when it first came out, cost 135,000 euros. But that's not the price today. As a result of dropping prices, you will be able to, in 2015, walk into a FNAC and say, I want a TV set. And they say, that'll be 1,000 euros or 1,200 if you want it in 4K. So we expect to see significant adoption of this new standard of televisions, and people are going to buy them, and they're going to bring them home, and they're going to turn them on, and what are they going to watch? Well, I'm going to connect it up to my Blu-ray player. That'll be great. Blu-ray doesn't support 4K. Well, I'll, I'll connect it up to my uh, satellite. Satellite doesn't support 4K. Over-the-air television transmission doesn't support 4K. The problem is that a 4K signal uses up four times as many bits as H each HD channel. And the broadcasters are not willing to give up four channels for one. So people will buy 4K TV sets, take them home, plug them in, and nobody will be able to watch any content in 4K. That's a real shame. That's too bad. Who here gets Netflix? I know it's just launched in France, but we've got a few. We've got a few. I'm surprised it's not higher. Can we do that again? How many people got Netflix? It's been two months now. OK, a little more, a little more. Netflix is in 4K. All of the repeat episodes of Breaking Bad are in 4K. All of the new season of Orange is the New Black, all of House of Cards, and the new series Marseille, which is being launched next year, uh, set in in France, will be in 4K. In other words, people will buy 4K TV sets, but the only way they'll be able to watch content will be over the top. Streaming, video on demand, internet services, and I will talk later about what that means. One of the things that we try doing every year is doing a little bit of myth busting. What was the hot topic in 2014? Wearables. Everybody was talking about wearables and how popular they were going to be. Our challenge was that, was this going to be the next smartphone? Was this the next TV set? Was this the next tablet computer? Uh, who here has tried a pair of wearables? Google Glass or anybody else? A few people, good, thank you. For those of you who have not, this is what it looks like when you, when you wear them. It's a, 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 a screen that's transparent, that means it doesn't work terribly well outside in direct sunlight. You wouldn't want to watch a movie. You wouldn't want to watch a TV show. You wouldn't want to watch a football game. You wouldn't want to read a lot of text because it's low resolution. They don't get rid of a smartphone. They cost currently over $1,500. Uh, that may come down. It's against the law to drive while wearing them. So when people ask me, is this the next smartphone, it, well, let's play a little game in the room. Let's play a little game in the room. Who here does not have a computer, access to a computer? Nobody in the room. Who here does not have a smartphone? 
One person in the room. Who here doesn't have a tablet or access to a tablet? Three people in the room. Who here doesn't have a TV set? Eh, three people in the room. To a very close approximation, those devices are ubiquitous. Nearly 100% of people in the Western world of a certain income level have smartphones, have TVs, have computers, have tablets. Who here, who here owns a chainsaw? I don't know how you say that in French. You know, this is the thing you chop down trees with. Who here owns a chainsaw? A few people. You have a cottage or a cabin or something like that. Who here, who here has a, a, I don't know, once again in French, how you say it, lawnmower for cutting the grass? Some people, not everybody. Who here owns a swimming pool? A few people. Around the world, lawnmowers, chainsaws, swimming pools are multi-billion dollar industries, but not everybody has one. They are 5, 10, 15, 20% of the market. In the same way, Deloitte is predicting that head-mounted wearables will not be the next smartphone, will not be the next television set. They will be a niche consumer product. Consumer. In the enterprise, this will be an absolutely enormous market. The business, the enterprise case for wearables is compelling. Every doctor, Every security guard, every person in a factory driving one of those little forklift trucks around a warehouse will have a device they can use that's hands-free, that has an augmented reality display showing where the material is, and third, with a real-time camera showing when they get there that the box was damaged in shipping and you don't need to pay because it's not your fault. Deloitte believes that the enterprise applications of head-mounted wearables will be 10 or 100 times larger than the consumer market. And just as a bit of news, uh, stories came out over the weekend suggesting that uh, Google itself is moving in this same way and thinking the enterprise market uh, may, be, uh, may be a bit bigger. Uh, Want to quickly touch on smartwatches. I'm not going to even get through all my slides, that's fine. Who here owns an iPhone? Come on, most of the people in the room I know. Who here owns an iPhone and a Mac? And iPhone, Mac, and iPad? Great. iPhone, Mac, iPad, and Apple TV? iPhone, Apple, Mac, iTV, and Steve Jobs pillowcases. Come on. I know, you. I know it's you. I know it's you. He's not telling us. He's not telling us. Who here is planning on spending between $600 and $10,000 on a screen that's 0.8 inches square? Eh, oh, okay, it's the guy with the pillowcases. Yes, thank you. Uh, sorry, just to go back. Our prediction, therefore, on this one is, once again, not a consumer market. We believe that these, on the other hand, may be an enterprise, enterprise tool. Uh, in Deloitte, UK, we are already using smartwatches for time entry. I'm going to skip over some of these slides because I've, no, I've got to do this one. In 2004, the world market for consumer electronics, specifically PC, smartphones, gaming consoles, TVs, and tablets, were $250 billion. This year, they'll be $770 billion. The market has tripled uh, in a decade. That is remarkable growth. But that growth is reaching a plateau. We are buying phones less frequently. Tablet market is saturated faster than we thought. Uh, PC sales are negative. The growth rate is dropping, all of which means less money for hardware means more money for software services and content, whether subscription. Uh, what do I mean by services? More data, more data plans. I'll skip this one. I'm actually going to have to cut through some of these because I, I must have talked more slowly than I thought at the beginning. Let's go with, oh, here we go. We'll go to this one. Remember I talked about 4K. This is before. 4K launched. Now, this is North America. The European numbers are lower. But remember that it's only been in the Nordics for two years. It's only been in the Netherlands for a year and a half. And in France, Germany, Belgium, Luxembourg, Austria, Switzerland, 
It's been two months. In North America, Netflix alone represents 34.2% of all traffic downstream in prime time. One out of every three bits in North America is already Netflix. And more and more people are signing up to over-the-top TV, and they're watching more and more hours each month, and 4K is coming. When you add up Netflix and YouTube and BitTorrent and Amazon Video and Hulu, the percentage of traffic in North America that is real-time entertainment is 68% as of the start of 2014. As of 2020, it will be 90%. Who are these people? What would you call the people on the front here? Sapeurs et pompiers in French, I know, but in English. Firefighters. They're in front of a big red truck that's a fire truck. The building, it even says on it, fire station. This is Toronto. What percent of calls that the fire department responds to in Toronto has anything to do with fires? Three. 97% of what the Toronto Fire Department deals with are cats stuck up in trees and people locked out of their houses and uh, emergency medical care. We still call it the Fire Department even though 97% of what they do has nothing to do with fires. And the reason I'm telling you this is this slide. We think of the internet, and you've got slides up here. You've got slides, I'm sure, the rest of the day you're going to be talking about the internet of things and big data, and cloud, analytics, distance medicine, distance education. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful things all going over the internet. And it will be less than 10% of traffic. The internet's like a highway. It's like the peripherique. As more and more traffic flows on it, you reach choke points. You need on-ramps and off-ramps. You need more lanes. And what emerges, we know this in France, not on the peripherique, but you get toll roads. Who pays? Who's going to install the capacity? Who's going to have the priority traffic? Who's going to build those off-ramps and on-ramps? We are already seeing this in the United States, where the carriers like Comcast, and this is in a country that believes in net neutrality. Already, the carriers like Comcast and others are telling the people who use the bandwidth, like Netflix, that you need to pay for connection fees to make sure your traffic gets there. This will come to Europe. This will be an issue in Europe, and this will be, I believe, the dominant issue over the next few years. I'm going to close off just with um, this one. Yep. Sorry? I was told I had 30 seconds left. No, no. 10 minutes. I'm going to, I'm going to do this. Well, two more. <sighs> Who here has not, has not read a print magazine in the last day? Has not read a print magazine. You read a print magazine t yesterday? Wow, that's very good. Congratulations to the French magazine industry. Who here has not read a newspaper, a print newspaper, in the last day? More. Ooh, that's not good. Who here hasn't listened to any radio? OK, I did, actually. Who here hasn't watched any TV? More people, traditional TV. Final question, and this is the important one. Who here hasn't seen any TV, listened to any radio, seen a newspaper, or seen a magazine? Who here hasn't done any? One guy. That's, that's how traditional media works. If I place an ad across all the traditional media in Ile de France in a given seven day period, not everybody sees every ad, but everybody sees one. And that's the magic of advertising. And that's why it's a $600 billion industry worldwide. Who here doesn't own a passport? What percent of Americans don't own passports? 66% of Americans. Two-thirds of Americans may not leave or re-enter their own country, 
legally. And when asked why, their answer is, everything I need is right here. UK data. When asked which media they would miss, 16 to 24 year olds, less than 0.5% would miss newspapers or magazines. Fewer than 4% would miss radio. And only one in seven would miss television. One of our predictions for 2015 will be about the emergence of a new class, 16 to 24 year olds, who are not digital natives. They are digital only. They consume mainly urban, mainly educated, but they consume no traditional media in a given week. And how do you reach those people? Tech, digital. How do you advertise to those people? Digital. How do you educate those people? How do you give them news? How do they, how do they get their information to vote in elections? This is once again why the importance of uh, network congestion and net neutrality is so important. Uh, what's going on in media? You can see this is US data, but 18 to 24 year old viewing is, is dropping 11. I've been doing media measurement for 30 years. An 11% decline is something that occurs in a decade, not in 24 months. Now, I'm going to give you one last sneak preview of one of our 2015 predictions, once again launching February 3rd here in Paris at the Deloitte office in Neuilly. This is my daughter, Erin. Erin is a wonderful kid, very smart, but she's all digital. She's always on her computer, she's always on her smartphone, she's always on her tablet, all the time, all the time, all the time. Uh, she just moved out. She got a cat. The cat's name is Rascal. But that's not its full name. Its full name is Raskolnikov. My daughter Erin, this summer, stole my copy of Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment. It's about a thousand pages long. She carried it everywhere. She took it to the beach, she took it to clubs, she took it on the buses, she took it on the metro, and she read it cover to cover, literally until the covers fell off. And I asked this 19-year-old girl, this, this digital child, why are you carrying around a thousand-page book that weighs one and a half kilograms? Why don't you read this on your smartphone? Why don't you read it on a tablet, on an e-reader? And she said, something this good deserves to be read in print. We are facing a generation that will not read magazines, that will not read newspapers, but they continue to read books. And one of our predictions for 2015 will be that young people not only continue to read, they do, they continue to read in print, and in fact, they read more books in print than older demographics do. They over-index on dead trees. What does that mean? What are the implications for technology, for marketing? How do print and magazines, uh, newspapers and magazines, access the same feelings that people have around books? Thank you very much. I'm going to turn it over. It's an honor to present before uh, Ministre Macron. Um, thank you for having me here. Perhaps I will be invited back to future internets. If you want to, you can reach me uh, on uh, uh, email if you want. Twitter, you can. Uh, reach me on, uh, follow me on Twitter. LinkedIn, I'm always uh, looking for that. Facebook, and of course I also have a blog where I give you previews of these kinds of topics. So uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, merci bien et bonne journée.